Okay, good morning. Sorry, we had a little technical glitch. There's a, a couple of, we're, we're streaming off of two platforms. LinkedIn Live is Problems. well on Zoom. One I'd like to two. welcome everybody. Jen, are we okay to start? I think we've got the green light. All right. Great. Thanks so much, everybody. We've got a lot of content to uh, get in today. Again, we're streaming on two platforms. First question, would like to get you all just kind of engaged a little bit. Tell us what metal you're tracking. You want to hear something about this morning. We'll try to cover it if we can. Throw it in the chat. Um, if you're on the LinkedIn Live, just let us know what metal, um, again, you're passionate about, need to know something about so we can take a peek. Um, we have kind of both conversations moderated. So we're going to cover hopefully about for the first 10 to 15 minutes, give you just a good outlook what we're seeing in the marketplace for 2023. We'll speak with my colleague, Nicole, who runs our MMO service, uh, does all of the write-ups and analysis across uh, a range of commodities, including the base metals and non-ferrous and, and ferrous metals. And then uh, we'll dive in with my colleague, Stuart Burns and co-founder of Metal Miner, who's joining us uh, from the UK this morning. And he'll cover some of the metals that he's tracking. Um, we'll get into some of the sourcing strategies we're looking at for this year. We've got a new white paper coming out and we'll let you know how to get all that uh, momentarily. So let's just kind of kick it off. Nicole, if you wouldn't mind, can you give us an overview of the primary macroeconomic drivers that we here at Metal Miner look at and kind of walk through? And don't forget to tell us the why we look at that. <laughs> You're muted. Sorry, Nicole. Okay, I'm going to share my screen for a moment. And um... I've got some slides pulled up. So I'm gonna begin with the USD. They're all of the slides I have are, are very interesting right now. Uh, the USD, it measures the value of the US dollar against a basket of other currencies. And the reason that we follow it is that it has a strong inverse correlation to commodity prices, including metals, because commodities are often priced in the US dollar. So the strength of the US dollar relative to other uh, currencies impacts buying power for holders of other currencies. Um, throughout the last year, we saw the index soar to a 20 year high. You can sort of see that very high peak and it peaked around September in September and then it's uh, uh, retraced substantially from that. Um, at present, there's in, in spite of the fact you can see it's clearly going down, uh, there's an element of uncertainty in terms of future directions from here. Um, on the one hand, because it's declined for months, we would expect a certain amount of correction to the upside. It's also nearing certain support levels that could trigger a bounce. Um, and while the Fed has slowed its pace, it's also indicated quite clearly that it's not a pivot and it's going to continue to raise and sustain high interest rates throughout the year, which is going to be a limiting factor in terms of potential downside until there is a pivot. Um, but that said, um, interest rates are slowing and the trend is your friend. So um, a continuation downward um, isn't out of the question either. Um, it's still, as you can see though, it's sitting historically high where it's at. The next thing I'm gonna move on to is energy. This is WTI oil prices. And they've also retreated from their peak um, last month. They moved sideways. There's an argument to be made that we're actually within a global energy crisis with China coming back online. And when China does return, you would expect to see that demand increases and that could pressure global energy, energy supplies. We've already seen energy pressured and weaponized because of what's happening in Europe with um, Russia. And so to see, it'll be interesting to see the impact of China coming back online in terms of how that impacts the global market and whether that energy crisis sort of expands from just Europe right now in to the rest of the world. Um, and if the if it does come to fruition, you would expect to see prices skyrocket um, and it could trigger a lot of different conversations from the ones we're having related to energy in terms of will there be a nuclear renaissance um, or could it lose momentum in some sectors that have a different margin, something like EVs. Um, and then the next thing I'm gonna move on to um, is China. We look at um, the FXI and that's the index of the 50 largest Chinese stocks that are traded on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. And it's a proxy essentially for what's going on in China. What we see is that uh, it 
bottomed out and what we're seeing is the a burgeoning recovery for China. It'll be interesting to see how that can whether that continues upwards. We would expect for it to as they make their way through COVID, although that could happen over the course of months until we see what the reality of China really is. But it did very much and decidedly hit a bottom and there appears some optimism about China's comeback and China recovery will mean demand will recover, although there's a question of to what extent, and that will have broader implications on the markets. Great, thanks, Nicole. What do you think um, is driving metal prices right now, um, You know, given the fact that the demand across many sectors appears more muted? Is it really the dollar? Is that where you're putting your money or? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's both the dollar and China. I think those are the really big stories right now, the, the shift down the shift from upward to downward is a big story for the US dollar and that has big implications on metal prices and then optimism about China too um, and the combination of those has been enough to see certain metals like copper and aluminum break out to the upside and others hit a bottom at the very least. Great, that's helpful. Um, Stuart, I'm gonna kind of switch gears over to you. We've started to see some big upticks in metals this year. So I see um, some of you have commented you're buying um, aluminum. I've seen copper in there. Uh, both of those are trading higher than they were in Q4. Um, I'm reminded that many com commodities traded wildly throughout 2022. And yet when you look at the start and the end of the year, kind of we ended up, you know, not in a vastly different spot. What do you see as the breakout metals in 2023? And can you give us some color commentary on that? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, Lisa. I think I think there are a number of sort of counterbalancing dynamics uh, that have been playing out this year, and they're going to continue into 2023. On the one hand, we've got, as Nichols already identified, a constrained uh, and potentially rising energy market. Uh, the higher energy prices in Europe have shuttered production of energy intensive industries like aluminum, zinc, copper um, have, have faced real headwinds this year in Europe, but also in China. China's faced significant uh, energy constraints that's limited uh, aluminum production, particularly there. Uh, then on the other hand, we've got prospects of a looming recession in um, Europe uh, and potentially the uh, slowing growth compared to previous years in China, which is having a depressing effect on prices. So th there's one dynamic potentially lifting and another potentially depressing. Um, yet at the same time, we've got consumption that's actually holding up very well around the world. And we have both exchange and off market inventory levels at record lows. Uh, some metals like uh, aluminium are at 20 year lows on, on the London Metal Exchange. They're at historic lows since 2007, 2008 on the Shanghai Futures Exchange. And off warrant stocks are also at, at significantly uh, depleted levels. So there's very little physical metal available and that's being reflected in high uh, physical delivery premiums for metal. And I think the relaxation, that the, 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 the uncertainty is the impact that the relaxation of COVID rules in China is going to have on demand this coming year. I mean, Nicole touched on this very well, that there's an expectation that China is going to come roaring back after the Chinese New Year. But um, we have reservations about that. In, in, infection rates are incredibly high in China at the moment, and that is causing some strong headwinds for growth in the country. Um, so we've got the prospect of higher prices for energy intensive metals. Definitely, that could be that could be a real issue next year. But on the other hand, we also have these uh, headwinds which have yet to really show themselves um, significantly. So it, it it's a very nuanced picture in the year ahead. The supply and demand narrative. And yeah. I think we've seen that even just in recent, I know in the news this week, we talked about JP Morgan is kind of got a mixed message. Earnings weren't great. Deal flow is slow, yet they see some recovery signs of life in China, which could bring back some of the demand and activity. So we'll be watching those prices. Nicole, anything you wanted to add regarding any of the metals just that we've covered? 
Um, I mean, it'll be something to watch to see exactly how all of the metals respond. There's a lot of speculation in terms of what China's, you know, what will really happen with China. I would say like expectations versus reality will um, dictate price direction for all of those things. And as Stuart touched on, you know, we could certainly see what the reality is, defy what expectations are in terms of the market. And I, I could see a case being made that, you know, maybe China recovers better. And that would be a huge impact because I don't think people are expecting that. And maybe they don't recover and that also would have an impact. That's helpful. You, you, you make a very interesting point, uh, Lisa, about the JP Morgan uh, report suggesting the construction sector uh, could be coming back in China. But we've got a lot of anecdotal evidence from uh, aluminum extruders who are heavily exposed to the construction market in China, who are laying off staff for the first time in 20 years because they do not see the construction sector coming back in 2023. Um, they've never done that before, even through peaks and troughs in construction. They've continued to grow, and yet now, for the first time, they're laying off. They're laying off significant numbers of staff. So, That's interesting. That that I think is also an indicator that within China, they've got great doubts about how strong growth is going to be this year. Whatever Beijing may be saying. Interesting. I love to get the man on the street kind of anecdote in there. We've got a lot of questions. Um, stainless steel. I'm going to ask. We're going to hold off on that one. We're going to cover stainless in a little bit. Um, and I'm going to just kind of switch gears here and flip the conversation from sort of like the forecast prognosis. So if we could summarize, we could say we're still going to see a lot of volatility. We've got competing supply and demand narratives and which one is going to win out. We're definitely in a supply constrained world. Stuart, you're talking about the inventory levels. Any uptick in demand could create uh, a situation where prices could go up. Of course, um, we'll have to see what demand looks like. But let's get into um, talking about some of the pr pressures that a lot of folks on, on this uh, uh, workshop are facing. Procurement professionals, they're out looking for cost reductions. They've got some pressure on margins this year. Stuart, as someone uh, who's both active in the aluminum industry and one who, uh, sadly, I'm going to uh, include myself in this bucket, is we've gone through many cycles together, you and I. What strategies do you think folks should take specifically as they relate to aluminum or just mm -hmm. out there? Yeah, we have a great deal of time. And so, so I'll just pick one for the time being is going to be the name of the game. And usually that plays into the hands of the seller. Uh, it, it's common for suppliers to point to, a, let's say, a 10 percent rise in base metal prices as justification for a 10 percent rise in the cost of materials or, or even of finished parts. With, but without clear visibility as to the breakdown of costs, it's, it's really hard for buyers to defend against cost rises. Uh, and to fight for cost reductions in the event of, of base metal prices coming down. Thanks. Yeah, you pulled up our ship cost model. This is this is good. So this is just a standard 50-52 grade of uh, uh, aluminum sheet, but it does illustrate rather nicely how the finished price of even a sheet is only 50%. Uh, coming from the base metal price. So if, if a base metal price increases by 10%, in reality, the finished price of a sheet is only going to rise by 5%. And the finished price of a component made from that 50-50 sheet is probably only going to rise by 1% to 2%. So the key here is to be buying on a per kilo or per pound basis, not on a unit price basis or per piece basis. It's only by breaking out what the base price is, what the conversion costs, what the physical delivery premium is for uh, an aluminum product, do you can have any sense of controlling base price metal increases and decreases um, with your suppliers. And the interesting thing is that, that most of us are buying as, as buyers, we're mostly buying from large distributors. This is exactly how the distributors in the mills. They always buy per, per kilo, per ton, per pound, and they always break out the base price, the conversion costs, the physical delivery premium. They never buy on a per piece basis because it's the only way you can control the costs is to have this transparency, this visibility into the, the cost of your, your buying. 
And just a note here, the base price is taking a trailing 30-day average, which is why that 2432 is not reflecting today's lovely, I, I don't know, close to 2600 price. 20, close to 2600 today, yes. Yeah, yes. that's that's the uptick that Nicole was talking about in expectation of what's going to happen in the, you know, might be happening in China. But um, if we could move on quickly, Lisa, you know, you've worked with dozens and dozens of clients over the years. What do you see as making this cycle different from those in the past? Uh, thanks, Stuart. I appreciate you saying that. So we're actually putting together a new uh, free piece of content in our best practice resource library. And one of the things that we've noticed this year, more so than any other year, is the amount of WIP work in process inventory that we're seeing on floors of our clients, um, on floors, I mean, from everybody that we've talked to. And it got us wondering, you know, I think last year we talked about this notion of just in time sourcing and just in case sourcing. And we were kind of like thinking about, hey, maybe we need to kind of shift inventory levels and look at those safety stock levels, adjust them accordingly based on that. But now we have a situation where it just got us thinking, you know, I, I like to recommend a book to everybody. If they haven't read it, it's like, to me, it's the classic supply chain book of all time. It's called The Goal. Um, I'm going to use a personal analogy and then relate it to what we're seeing in the market and kind of maybe a new paradigm or way for folks in procurement to kind of think about um, sourcing strategies in this environment. But basically, I always joke, I, my family of five, I've got three boys, and um, I always joke, my husband is basically about 100 yards ahead of the rest of the family. And I always joke, I said, you know, we're only going to get to where we're going when the three-year-old, you know, at the time he was three, gets to where everybody else is. So you are as fast as your slowest link, right? That's the theme of that book, The Goal. So what we're looking at is, you know, if you've got lead times on say capacitors and chips for, you know, up to 44 weeks, I've heard, and even longer, you know, the question becomes, should you be building that inventory with, you know, the quote unquote, the missing materials and just stocking it up, tying costs in, you know, worse work in process inventory um, and not turning your inventory as well. And, and obviously that money's all tied up. You've got fixed capital and costs all um, enmeshed with that. So the notion here is, you know, should the pro procurement professional be sourcing materials, not so much based on, obviously based on the demand in sales order books, but also what the slowest part of that supply chain looks like. And then dropping in the other pieces and components for that build, if you will, um, based on really the lead times as opposed to how maybe you've traditionally done that. And we, we talk about that a little bit, and that's probably the subject of a future workshop, but that is something that we're seeing. We're just seeing so much inventory and kind of half-built materials and warehouses filling up with half-built things because they're waiting on chips and parts and, and things of that nature. So um, that was just my my two cents there, but maybe perhaps another way to think about it. Um, so let's switch gears and kind of move. Nicole, if you don't mind sharing the should cost model for stainless steel, how would you, Stuart, use a forecast predictor tool such as the one we have at Metal Miner to lower your stainless costs? How, how might that work? Mm. Well, I mean, the, the largest component of the um, stainless steel surcharge is is the nickel component and uh, you know some would argue it's a bit of a hobby horse of mine but some would argue that the lme nickel market is already broken following last march's uh, debacle if you like that that's the reality of it um volumes are half now what they were uh, this time last year and there's a similar situation on the shanghai futures exchange many thought that the the Shanghai Futures Exchange would step in and provide true price transparency and and uh, and guidance where the LME was was failing to do so in in Q2 and Q3 of of last year. The reality is volumes are so low on the Shanghai Futures market as they are on the LME that many are questioning whether what we're seeing on the LME is is really the true market price for nickel. And um, Interestingly, just in, in the last few weeks, um, there's been a lot of reports about uh, the fact that, that Martin Abbott, who was formerly the CEO of the LME, has moved to um, global commodity holdings 
uh, and is running their global coal platform, which is going to launch a nickel contract for uh, grade one nickel briquettes and uh, nickel cathodes. Uh, it has the backing of the major miners, BHP and, uh, and so on, uh, Anglo, and the big trading companies like Glen Glencore and Trafigura. So it's got heft behind it. It's got weight behind it. And, and it's got an existing model behind it. So we could find that as the year develops that um, the nickel price has uh, on the LME has got a, has got a challenger uh, for true discovery. Now, as far as the buyer is concerned, um, our nickel forecast at the moment is showing that uh, February is going to be higher than the current surcharge for January, uh, but March is going to be lower than February. So armed with that kind of information, if you have access to a tool, you'll be able to position your buying depending on what kind of surcharge you were going to get caught for uh, in the months ahead. That's uh, not a situation that stainless buyers have had the opportunity to access in the past, but it now gives them a degree of transparency into forward pricing, which um, which uh, certainly allows a lot more savvy um, positioning of purchasing uh, at least a couple of months into the future. Great, Stuart, quick question. What do you think the likelihood is of this new exchange to come in and take the place of the LME? I mean, betting betting odds, what do you got going here on the new exchange i think if it was just being launched uh today without any real real sort of uh committed backing to it i'd say it could be five years before it has any impact on the nickel market and then the lme's been around for over 100 years it isn't going to sort of die away even for a major contract like especially for a major contract like nickel but the fact that the major miners and the big trading companies between them who represent a very significant proportion of the physical trading in nickel products around the world, the fact that they are putting their backing behind it says to me that it actually has it has a good chance of gaining traction uh, and gaining gaining volume, and that's what it's all about. It'll get liquidity as it gets volume, and so I think that's definitely one to watch over the next six months how that develops, and we'll be reporting on it, of course, uh, on Metal Miner. Great. Appreciate that. Nicole, I'm going to switch gears and come back to you. We've got a lot of questions in the sidelines here about the steel market. Um, so if you don't mind unmuting yourself, I'm going to remind you to do that. Um, and you want to give us just a sense of kind of what you're seeing in domestic steel markets. Um, and then I'll take a couple of follow up questions that we've got for that as well. Absolutely. So in steel markets, HRC, CRC, HDG prices hit a bottom and they've begun to rise. Um, and so that's there's an interesting reversal where plate prices are sliding, but the other forms of steel are rising now, which is opposite of what we saw for months and months and months. Um, for, for the flat road steel prices, um, they're sliding, they're not sliding or they're not, they're climbing, they're not climbing as steeply as they did where we saw them hit historic highs. Um, but they're they're increasing. The, it was started by steelmakers who levied price hikes on forms of steel. That doesn't always mean that prices will rise after they were, but they did, and they were supported by the fact that we've lost competitively priced European imports. Their U.S. prices are normally on the higher end of what global prices are. China would be at the bottom, but European prices have now extended beyond. U.S. prices, which has allowed steelmakers to take advantage of that. And I, I recently heard of another price hike, I think that Cleveland Cliffs is implementing. And when they first implemented it, they reportedly turned away offers for anything lower. So they had a certain amount of uh, price control and stamina to, to keep going with those price hikes. And reportedly buyers are sort of accepting what the prices that they're giving. That said, and I'm gonna, this I think is a big caveat. I'm gonna share my screen briefly once more. Um, mill lead times are still short, um, historically speaking, from where they from where they um, tend to sit. And so there isn't necessarily what we would see as like some uptick in demand that it's really driving prices upward. They're short. Material is generally well available to consumers. 
And so there's downside potential even still within the U.S. market, and they'll be continued to be pressured throughout the next, throughout the year as economic concerns compound, federal interest rate hikes, that sort of thing. Helpful. Um, I'm going to answer a question live. Somebody had asked, what are our thoughts on the reinforcing steel market? We don't focus so exclude, you know, so heavily on the reinforcing steel market. However, a lot of those products follow the plate market, which we do cover extensively. So as Nicole, as you had indicated, you know, plate prices seem um, they're coming down a little bit. I don't know that we expect any big crash. I think the infrastructure bill is keeping plates somewhat well supported. Um, you know, but but the prices certainly have been coming off a little bit um, in recent weeks, which I think probably is what we're going to see in the rebar market um, as well. A couple more steel questions I thought we could um, address while we have them on the fly here. A question about, um, and I'm going to open this up to anybody who wants to answer it of, on our panel here. What impact will environmental policies have on steel and other metal production, um, just a reference to blast furnace versus electric arc furnace production. I'll take a first pass and then kind of Nicole, I'll skim back over to you. Certainly, I think um, there is strong, there's a strong push to electric arc furnace production globally um, that's inclusive um, in China. So we're definitely seeing that trend. I think it is having a big impact. Um, I'm still in the camp of, I don't believe people are willing to pay more for the same grade quality of steel, all things being equal. But if two things are being equal and one is greener than the other, I do think people are, you know, will choose the green product. Nicole, did you have anything you wanted to add to that or some thoughts? Um, no, I'm, I'm in agreement with you. I mean, I think unless we see some like government incentives for, for, that could help that. Um, but yeah, I agree. There is like a larger push for environmental policies and they've offered a lot of support for plate, like which we just touched on. A lot of the green policy has benefit of that in terms of like wind towers. That's a big driver of a lot of things. So it does offer support. I think especially kind of to circle back to what I was talking about at the beginning um, in terms of the energy markets, it'll be interesting to see how like if energy skyrockets, whether some of those conversations start to shift in terms of how we navigate that and in terms of environmental policies too, because some of that might um, be different in a scarcity sort of mindset when it comes to energy prices rising. I think, I think you make a great point there, Nicole. I think we've, we've got a short term and a long term situation with this. I think in the long term, the path is clear. Uh, you know, environmental policies are going to have the greatest influence. We're going to have a shift to EAF. We're going to have a shift to, to other forms of production. But I think in the uh, in, in the short term, the environmental question has almost been thrown out of the window with the cost of, of energy. Great. Thank you both for that. We're kind of Coming up on our, our time, there were some other questions. I definitely um, will want to reach back out to you and, and answer those questions real quickly. Somebody had asked about um, where do we think the automotive market is going? Do we see it coming back long-term for carbons was the question. Um, I'd see automotive slowing this year, not, not increasing. Um, basically, I think, I, I invite everybody to take a drive down to their local car dealership and you the story is is very well apparent uh car dealerships are stocked full of cars again uh the used car market is dropping so I think it's going to be a slower market will it be slower than I mean last year we had the supply constraints with the chips and that lowered the numbers um I think automotive is going to be a little soft this year as well. I just wanted to point out, um, we've got for everybody a whole bunch of free resources on the Metal Miner website. Uh, if you've seen some clicks here, feel free to sign up for our weekly newsletter. We put comments and commentary in that newsletter that do not appear anywhere else on Metal Miner. It's a great way to get a few nuggets of things going on. Um, along with um, articles are all free to use, our resource library, this new white paper will be in there. We invite you all to join us. And with that, we're going to let you all go. Sorry to run a minute over. I know we started a minute late. Thank you so much. And we look forward to seeing you at our next event. Mm -hmm.